No, let's make a quick round of introductions on the topic of how to create a learning culture and prove its business value. So two topics that we're um, are passionately aligned to, one around how do you create vibrant learning cultures? Um, and the second one is how do we make sure that what we're doing, the organization recognizes the value of, of doing that? So, um, hey, Megan. Uh, um, so just around the room, let's start off with uh, start off with Shane. So tell us who you are. Thank you, Steve. Um, it's a good question. So I'll be concise, right, because you've given me time to prepare. Um, I am a curious participant in the world of learning, hotel leadership development, and personal growth. I think that's very important to me. Um, am I an industry expert? I had to question mark myself there, right? Because that's how you positioned me in this in this webinar. And I, I love it and I appreciate oh, I it. I see you. <laughs> but to put some context around it, right? So I was born into hospitality in 1985. I spent 15 years participating in some form of learning uh, through in, in the UK and in Sri Lanka. Uh, I then moved across to the UK and spent 10 years building my understanding of informal mentoring. So that's where my academic background comes from. So when I share my, my, my views and my perspective in this conversation, that it's formed of those elements. And most recently, I spent 10 years in operations working for Intercontinental Hotels Group uh, before spending seven years focused on L&D and really focused on developing ecosystems and, and learning experiences that promote social learning and collaboration. So that's a bit about me. Um, and that's how I'll be sharing my views on the call. Thanks, Shane. Thanks for being succinct on that. Siri. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here and see all this activity already in the chat. Uh, so I'm Siri Vikander. Uh, I'm presently in Stockholm and I work as a people growth advisor, mainly in Sweden. I used to be a very happy Fuse customer when I was a director of people growth at the uh, Scandic hotel chain, that is the largest Nordic hotel chain. Uh, and I was there for, I think, three or four years. And for the first time uh, in my whole career, working with L&D in different positions and different companies, we could measure the result and the effect of the things we did uh, very much thanks to the inspiration that we got from uh, fuse customers like fuller's mm. thanks sorry. and andy yep hi everyone uh, andy stamps so uh, i now work for fuse as a learning consultant um but previously worked for avon which is one of fuse's clients uh, <laughs> led the implementation of fuse uh, across avon's 53 global markets um, and I spent the last 10 years working in various different roles within uh, digital experience and product design, um, but now on board with, with Fuse, helping their clients and prospective clients um, in terms of realising the, the value that Fuse is bringing to their organisation. Thanks, Eddie. And Tanif, latest addition to the team. Yes, and very happy about that. I am the performance consultant at Fuse and um, to... To Siri's point, um, my role is really to link the business measures, the success metrics to a measurable learning design so that we can um, link the learning experience in the flow of work and the benefits of that to tangible um, business outcomes. Thanks, Andy. And Sylvia is um, organizing the event in the background. So a big shout out for the great works that she always... Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming. <laughs> No worries at all. So um, quite informal this discussion, as I said, love to get questions coming into the chat. And the first question we're going to uh, kick us off with is we talk about creating great learning cultures uh, and measuring the value. But I guess it's a great first question, right? So um, just in your opinion, your mindset, Shane, what do you what do you what do you mean by a learning culture? What is it? Yeah, th thanks for the caveat. I appreciate that. Uh, I'll share my perspective. Right. So you know what I'm like, Steve. Right? I had to go down the rabbit hole a little bit to understand what is culture to start off with, right? What does that mean to me based on my experiences? Because then that can formulate my thinking into what is it uh, transitioned into when we talk about a, a learning culture. So as I started digging, right? So I started looking around, searching my thoughts, trying to put together something that would be uh, concise to understand what my perspective of a culture is. And then I landed on um, this, this, this model, let's call it, or like a triangle. So the first thing that kind of forms that is a set of ideas, right? So that defines a culture, a set of ideas. Alongside that, it's the, the customs that are associated with that culture as well. And then the third part to that is the social behaviors associated with that cultural piece, right? So I'll kind of translate that into a bit more of a, 
uh, into some context, right? So when I say a set of ideas, my interpretation of that is it's, it's values, it's these commonalities. It's the values that hold this triangle together. And then when we talk about customs, it's the manifestation of these ideas and these values into programmable habits, right? So that's where the, the beauty actually starts to come to life. And then collectively, right, these social behaviors are the collective consciousness of this culture, right? So that's what, for me, what culture is, right? It's, it's this triangle that's meant to be working in harmony. So when you dig a little bit deeper then, and if I apply that logic into what is a learning culture, I've taken those words, right? It's the values, it's the habits, it's the behaviors synthesizing to create an environment that fosters the desire for personal growth. It's the individual, right, that has this need, but it's the collective that forms the culture. That's, that's quite beautiful. Thank you. I'm, not, I'm glad we recorded that. <laughs> that, that, was, that was a beautiful articulation. Um, other people have come into that. Who, who would like to love to add to that? I see Andy and, and, and Sri both thinking that. You want me to start, Andy? Yeah, yeah. go for it. Um, for me, culture is something you sense or something you feel when you come in contact with an organization, and their brand, their people. It's something you immediately feel when you enter like a hotel door or a food store door or a digital door into a Teams meeting. And for me, the, the, what you feel is whether this is a culture where I am welcome where I can be myself, where I can take a risk. Uh, will I still belong to this culture and this group, even though I make a mistake or I look bad or stupid? Will they still take care of me? Will I still belong here? And that is something you sense immediately. It takes like 10 seconds and then you know. Uh, and within an organization, this could be different in different parts, of course. But uh, for me, a learning culture is to create that uh, sense of safety so you can learn and try new things. Wow, that's pretty beautiful as well. Uh, um, thanks, Siri, for that. Uh, Andy? Um, yeah, I had a big smile on my face when Shane kind of summarised that and brought it all together in terms of environment, because it was the, um, the exact words that I used yesterday on a, a similar call. Um, I think that the learning culture uh, manifests in that environment that nurtures those moments that allows us to go and grow. And the, I use the analogy where those learning moments, and they're different, they're a push and pull, and there's some that are very direct and some that are indirect. If we imagine those as, as seeds, we nurture it through, um, as uh, Vivi mentioned in the chat, through the 12 leaders engagement, through things like the advances in technology, the leadership mindset, the way in which we create and build content and design learning experiences and all these aspects they, they nurture it and as they nurture it we grow and that growth represents value and it's, it's a great analogy and a great way to put it but that environment that we create that creates that place of safety where I can learn I can explore and become uh, more curious about um, content and topics and, and knowledge um, for me that that is all encompassing what a, a learning culture is. I really appreciate that. Uh, um, and and uh, yeah, one of the things we'll, we'll come dive into, I think, is that, that habits piece, right? So, because I think I'm hearing in all of you, right, that there is a certain type of habits we're, we're trying to see, um, feel, and, and measure, right, which we're, we're maybe coming to next. Before I move into the, into the how, so, so how do we actually create it? Any final comments people want to move into before I, I jump to that next question? And Tanis, you, you don't have to just be on chat. If you want to dive in, just dive in at any time as well if you feel like you want to contribute in. Okay, so let's go to the second question, right? So, and, and really appreciate that that first, because I do think we need to define it. If we don't define what we're shooting for, right, then how do we measure it and how do we create it, right? So I think really appreciate everyone's feedback into that first part. So we're going to ask Siri to lead off with the, the second question, which is, as learning and people leaders, what specific steps can we take to positively impact the development of a learning culture within our organization. So lead us off, Siri. So apart from implementing views. Uh, <laughs> well, that's the baseline, right? That's, that's, yeah, that's the baseline. Idea. Okay, so we have the baseline. Yeah. Uh, this is actually the most common question I get from leaders that want to create the learning culture. So how do you do it? And it's, um, 
there is no short answer uh, because this is a complex question and you need to work on different levels. Uh, but what I usually say is that the easiest thing to do is to start with yourself. That is hopefully the one thing you can control. Um, and you can also start immediately with all these behaviors that drive learning. And we got uh, from, from uh, the uh, Northern University in Sweden, we got this um, research that confirmed the things that we know, but they just said that uh, curiosity is the main behavior that drives learning. And, they, it's, and, and then what is then curiosity? Yeah, it is to ask questions, to have, use your big ears and listen for perspectives is also to try out new things. And when you are um, a role model uh, for learning, others will copy your behavior. So that's an easy way to start, to create a learning culture. But then I also often talk about the importance to have um, uh, an engaging story about the future for the organization and why it's so important to get there. And, and usually there, there is such a story, but it's only a small part of the organization that keeps on talking about this engaging future or engaging story. You need to train all the leaders and you have to get the leaders and the trainers and all the communicators to keep on repeating this story about this future and why it's important to get there. Because everybody in the organization makes so many um, decisions on a daily basis. So they need to make those decisions in the right, so we get in the right direction. Uh, and there is also um, a third thing that I would like to mention here, and that is cross-functional collaboration. We're really lousy at that. Really lousy. And I think it's because we feel stupid when we collaborate with somebody uh, or another department that use different abbreviations or have different ways of doing things. And we don't like to feel stupid at work, so we stay where it's safe. But to, since the, our tasks become more and more complex and the development is so rapid, we need to work cross-functional. So we need to practice on uh, cross-functional collaboration. So as an organization, we then need to put down in a framework, what does great collaboration look like in our organization? We've done that for leadership, we've done it for, for culture, but we haven't really done it for collaboration. And we need to also um, give the teams a toolbox so they can practice on their collaboration. And maybe just before I pass to the rest of the team, right? So one of the things I used to love that you used to do when you were a people leader, at, um, people learning leader at Scandi, you used to talk about uh, learning five minutes a day. That, yes. was a, that was a really cool, you used to have badges, right? You have little badges and stuff, didn't yes, you? Yes, we did. I mean, just maybe talk to that because that was, I guess, a real practical thing to try to create that thinking that connects to the, the habits. Yeah, and we couldn't because um, at that stage, no, we were not allowed to say you need to learn new things all the time. So the only thing that was possible to say it, uh, in collaboration with the union and what was possible in the culture was five minutes a day. We all have five minutes a day. So that's how we sort of, we thought, oh, let's start with five minutes. That's what we can do. If we start there, we might create the learning behavior that goes on and on. And like you said, badges, because with HR and communication and IT, we work closely together to roll out Fuse and the learning culture. Mm. Thank you. And, and Shane or Andy, do you want to come in? Or, or Tanit, do you want to come into that stuff? Andy, you want to go first? Please go ahead. Yeah, I, I can relate to, to, to definitely two of, of um, serious points there. The, the leadership piece is so important. And if I, if I kind of draw on my experience in, in Avon, um, I think personally that there was an initial um, challenge, which is to get your, uh, your high level management, your board bought into the Fuse philosophy and, and the Fuse way of working and, and to relinquish an, a, a, an extent of the control that you may have previously had in terms of push learning to becoming more push pull, more towards the pull. Um, but particularly when we think about the, the field managers, the sales leaders that enable them, 
we found that the sales leaders, uh, sorry, the representatives with the most engagement were those that were within the teams where the sales leader was also highly engaged. And that point around display the behaviors and, and demonstrate the behaviors that you want everyone else to follow is, is super, super important. And then on the, the kind of collaboration cross-functional piece, I noted two things. Uh, and you just to dive down, we go to the next point, because yeah. I think you, you, your data really, you had a hunch on that one, and then you looked at it on data. Just want to expand out a little bit on you, what you saw around that, that link between, I guess, the team leader, team manager, and the individual contributor engagement. Yeah. So as I said, when we opened up, we implemented Avon in, in 53 uh, countries globally. So very different environments across those, those 53. Um, a hypothesis that where the sales leader demonstrates these values and has that high level of engagement that we want to see that that translated down to their team and so we mapped out the adoption and engagement of representatives um, against the um, engagement and adoption of sales leaders and there was a clear correlation markets that had really low adoption with leaders were on the left side of the graph as were their, their representatives and those that had higher higher levels of engagement and adoption were on the right hand side, there was a very clear, distinct um, correlation between the two. It was it was huge, wasn't it? Sorry, and I just want to make the, to hit that point. And what yeah. you saw there, we see whenever we time we look at that data in other clients, it, it's every time, right? That, and and it is interesting, right? Because when we come on to the how do you create engagement, right? And sometimes you do an A/B test and you see massive engagement in one area and then not in another. The people go, oh yeah, but those individuals naturally will be engaged, right? They're, they're just different to the people over here. But then to your point, when your hypothesis was, I don't think that's the case, right? I think actually the biggest thing is team leaders. And that data came out really crystal clear that that was the number one impacting factor, you know, in your environment. And we, we've done that analysis in 10 other clients and seen exactly the same thing. So I think, I think it's a, it's it's a huge point, right? I I, I think that um, not to let go off, right? So sorry, on to your next point. Uh, then just on the, the collaboration, the cross-functional piece, I noted two things down. The first one is, um, you know, I, I've seen examples where a learning strategy. I don't want to isolate it just to L and D, but that the learning strategy is is completely isolated to the strategy of the organisation. And, and that for me just seems bizarre. Um, and the second point was in, around the cross-functional piece. If you're in a, an industry that's manufacturing a product in an R&D, that then translates into marketing campaigns and brand and advertising campaigns. It has a communication strategy that goes with it. Surely L&D and the, the product knowledge and the experience that all relates to the launch of that particular product needs to translate to your workforce. And, and that cross-collaboration, synchronization of strategy is so important because if you're, if you're just creating content for content's sake and it's, you know, just for the purpose of creating content for someone, for someone to read, if that's not enabling them to do their job or it's not aligned to you as an organisation in achieving your goals, then you have to question why, why are you creating that in the first place? Thanks, Andy. Uh, Shane, do you want to add to that? I'm just conscious Tenet was unmuted. Tenet, did you want to, to do you want to? Okay, cool. Um, so Steve, to, I, I think just, I, I had to refresh my memory of the question because I, I had to rewind back to where we started. Um, and you were looking for like specific steps, right? And then Siri was quite clear to articulate the fact that it's so complex, right? There's not one size that fits all, that it's, it's very circumstantial, right? But I think there's a couple of things that uh, remain constant throughout the conversation. I think one of the things that Siri called out was around habits right and how the first thing we need to look at is ourselves and I found that beautiful that really resonated uh, I have a friend his name's Stefan he's one of my colleagues in, in Germany and he introduced me to this book called Atomic Habits right and in Atomic Habits they give you this uh, this framework of how to create a habit and it's the same thing Siri said the first thing that you need to start on is identifying who are you like what is what do you stand for are you a learner Right. And then if you're not that, what are the mechanisms that you can deploy to change your mindset, to change your philosophy and your perspective so that it doesn't become solely reliant on role modeling or looking at other people to understand who am I? It's understanding within yourself. Who are you? Do you want to learn? Do you have the desire? And if not, it's then questioning yourself. Right. So that really resonated in terms of we can deploy all these mechanisms, but the first place we probably need to start is ourselves. Right. And then to Andy's point, I think it's this whole 
ecosystem, this environment that we create, that when you identify that need, how do you satisfy it? How do you, how do you like, you know, get that craving out of your system so that, you know, th it's, it's not one size fits all. So there are opportunities to pull on threads. So it's just going back to that concept of being receptive as well, right? So I think that's something that Siri called out as well, right? Receptivity is critical, right? So then if you are open to listening and to understanding and to, to expanding your mindset, then if you have the right tools and the learning opportunities in front of you, it's like this recipe for success. There's some real synergy there. So just start within yourself though. That's what I kind of took away from that. Maybe just for the rest of the audience, for those who haven't seen this this stuff before, right? So just hit on top of that. So some of these things have already been talked about. So this is what we, I guess, internally have looked at over the years um, when we think about what's the things we've seen impact. And obviously technology is an enabler, right? But by itself, it's not the whole answer, right? You can use technology brilliantly and you can use technology terribly. Um, and, and I guess a lot of the time, you know, in existing clients, Hanif and Andy especially now, are going when we look at clients, um, saying how do we help existing customers, we normally, I guess, zone in on the, the most obvious places to work on. So those are the kind of the highlights in, in, in pink, right? The data bit, so where's it working, where's it not working? That That's kind of really, you know, super interesting. Um, content strategy, so, you know, are we just school creating big courses or are we also making content available in ways that we can, are in tune with our new habits, right? And actually, I think there was a nice little slide in here, just not to make this slide heavy, but... If we think about when we always ask this question, right, we always ask this question of people saying, you know, where do you, and an interesting thing for the audience to put in there. So when you, you know, when you want to learn in your personal lives, where do you start? Be interesting just for the, just for the audience we got, um, who wants to put a little, little chat inside there. So when you start your own personal journeys, where do you start? Who's going to, who's going to start off with? Where's well, going with the audience? Where would you start, Shane, in your personal journey? Question for me or Shane in South Africa? I mean, you, you, you. Where did I start my personal journey of? Yeah, so of you know, learning? where do you start? Uh, it's it's a it's an interesting one. It's evolved, right? So I had this conversation today with a colleague. I was like, normally I'd go to Google, but now my first source of knowledge would be Chat GPT because of the way it delivers the answer to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's interesting. So obviously, I'd ask Siri, but what would Siri do? You're on mute, Siri. Yeah, sorry. Could you repeat the question? I, I, I don't really understand. Please so, say. So when, so when you don't know something, when you want to learn something in your personal life, yes, so you don't know. Where do you start your journey? Nowadays, I always start with uh, the chat GPT. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, a, it's, a, it's someone I talk to now like two or three times a day. So whenever I have a task, I first start by sort of by myself because I want to have some sort of idea, and then I ask the chat. And then I all then I add some human Siri touch to it, and then I get going. Um, so that's where I where I start. Uh, and just today I asked because I work with a customer who has several team members with uh, neurodiverse. I learned a new word today: neurodiverse. Uh, and um, how, and I asked the chat, how can you, how can we, what can we use you for to help this these people to perform at work? And I got the, all these ideas from reading out loud instructions, from uh, turning difficult language into simple language, um, all kinds of things. Mm. And, and I think so else we've got we got um we got tinkering we've got chat GPT uh, we, got, we got Jessica uh, uh, YouTube uh, and it is interesting right so um uh and that's again if we maybe look at the second point so we're where when we want to feed our digital curiosity where do we go to so when you've got 10 minutes spare and you want to you you, know, you want to fill it up with stuff where do we go so we, we always go to chat GPT or to Google or YouTube. We want to learn something specific. But when we got 10 minutes spare and we're not trying to do something specific, where would we go? Flipboard? Yeah. I'm a big flipboard lover. Flipboard is one of my go-to ones. Mm. What else do we have? LinkedIn learning. It's interesting. Offline and go for a little walk if he does. But, and, and I guess the interesting thing is a lot of it, and Flipboard's a good idea, right? So is a lot of it is feeds, right? It is feeds, whether that's a TikTok feed, an Instagram feed, a YouTube feed, or maybe not a Netflix feed, but, but there's so much feed-based feed stuff, right? That is trying to say, if you've got the spare time, let me intelligently try to work out 
what to surface to you towards that. And I guess, you know, in our, in our part, then that becomes kind of interesting to say to your bit, Siri, how do we now start to use these technologies or these habits we've got? How do we use our chat GPT habit, our Google habit, our YouTube habit, you know, all of those habits in times how we, we, we think about learning towards that. So just wanted to throw that one out there to when we start now thinking about what do we, what can we possibly impact and how does, uh, what else are we thinking of doing and what have we seen work um, around, around creating a positive learning culture? But the thing about the Instagram feeds is that they may, for, for me at least, they make me stupid. <laughs> so I think you need, to, you need to follow you need to follow Sylvia's artwork. Yes, yeah, <laughs> of course. But there is also this algorithm that put in things that I don't want to see, so I can't really moderate um, the way I want it. So I rather go somewhere where I get smarter and better. Uh, and that helps me that I, I'm not afraid of that will manipulate me in any way. Mm. But it, but interesting, I mean, it's interesting you hit the point there on ChatGPT, right? Because obviously that's a, there's a wealth of knowledge that it has. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's something new, right? That's entered our world. So that's, a, new, that's a, a whole new way of learning on top of these other techniques we talked about today. Yeah, but, it's gonna go, but is it nice? Is, this, is it someone you can trust? We don't know yet. We don't know yet. Do you, what do you trust yet. most? Do you trust Siri most or ChatGPC? Uh, well, <laughs> trust Siri always. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Shane, do you want to come in on that? On this topic? In what sense, Steve? What angle are you looking at this from? Well, no, no, just in terms of, I guess, what you've seen work um, and, and the things we can possibly contribute to creating that learning culture. So let me, let me just put that, that um, initial, initial question back on there before we move on to the um, how do we measure it type thing, right? So let me just... Um, so this was the this was the initial question, um, which is what are the things that we can do? What specific steps and what things we can can we do to positively impact the development of a learning culture with an organization? So Siri kicks us off. Anything anyone else and you want to maybe shame add to that? And I think Tanya's gonna say something off to you or before you maybe. Please, Tan, go ahead. Go for it, Tanya. Thank you. Just sharing some um some great um input on the chat line. Jessica mentions yeah. the um, ability, well, the reflection exercise and the power of that mm. in developing a continuous learning culture. <laughs> and I love the question from Mikael as well, in terms of, um, do, you, do you believe that we need to unlearn some habits and is that important to do? Mm. I thought those were two great mm. questions to ask. Yeah, great. Huh? Okay, so maybe uh, maybe on to the third question then, guys. So the third question uh, into Andy, uh, which was, and I'll put it on the screen for you, Andy, just in case you want to refresh it. Um, the third question here was around, so in, in addition to additional methods of measuring, and interesting, we, we touched on that, maybe touched on your journey, um, what new approaches can we now think about? Because we, we've already talked about, we're now learning through YouTube style ways and Google style ways and ChatGPT style ways and lots of these technologies are now becoming embedded into learning technologies like Fuse. So if we're now interacting with all these different ways, not just courses. And how do we measure that? And how do we know it, it's worth it's worth doing? Yeah, um, I think I start by by, by saying I, I'm not completely dismissive of measuring the impact of, of training where there is a targeted and a specific intervention. So an example of that would be uh, if you design an onboarding program, there is a very clear purpose to an onboarding program, which um, you know, is designed to get someone to a level where they are capable to perform in a role. Um, and and the, the, the design of that boarding pro onboarding program to, can be to get them to a certain level of proficiency. Um, it could be the speed that it takes to get them to that level of proficiency. And, and you can measure directly against that. But when we, you know, we've talked so much about the different ways in which we learn, um, the, the formal versus the informal, the um, curious, uh, discoverable elements and, and everything else that sits within an environment like Fuse. That simply can't be measured by saying someone has done a one particular piece of tra training or one particular piece of course, uh, uh, one particular course, sorry. Um, so when uh, we looked at this at Avon, historically, we were very fixated on Completion of training means that someone is trained and therefore they should be performing better or it should have an impact. And in, in most cases, it was very hard to prove that. And I think LD acknowledges quite broadly that demonstrating the value that, that 
training has on an organization is extremely hard because there are so many factors at play. Uh, and I, for one, accept that it's very hard to say definitively 100% that training has been the, the complete and utter root cause of, of that improvement. But where an ecosystem and an environment that, that nurtures all of these learning moments, surely it then has to come down to the engagement and how people engage that, how often they engage with that, always working towards that uh, creation of the, the habit of the continuous learning. Um, and that was something that we looked at in Avon. And when we did some research a couple of years ago now and looked at splitting the um, audience between those that engage with a low level of frequency, medium level of frequency and high level of frequency, uh, but also looked at their consumption, whether they engage with, uh, with a high or a low level of consumption made absolutely no difference to their performance. It was, it was really, really tiny percentage difference. But as you work through the low, the medium and the high, the performance differentials were massive, both in terms of sales performance, in terms of retention, in terms of activity. There were really clear differences. I'm talking three figure differences here in terms of the variation between low, medium and, and high. So I think when we um, measure the impact that, that learning has, we can keep an eye on, on specific courses or specific, you know, targeted interventions and the impact that that is having but we shouldn't underestimate the power of the ecosystem and the, the overall environment that we've created and measure that through engagement and the creation of the behavior of that continuous learning. Because in the Avon case, it was clearly uh, demonstrated that where that's the case uh, and you create that habit, you get much better results at the end of it. And that, that's quite huge. It's quite different, right? Because I think that if you look at traditional Kirkpatrick models, right, which has been the model of learning for like a too many years, right, it was to some degree the mindset around that has been design the course. And then, I mean, I know it wasn't designed that way, but most people still design the course and then think about afterwards, how do I now try to measure the impact of that course? And that's people being kind of with that conundrum for the 20, 30 years in the corporate world. And I think in many cases, right, I mean, when we did it with our clients, we always found the result was probably single digit at best even the best course in the world was, was single digit so i think what's hugely interesting about your piece of work which we see replicated in in many clients right which is the question you asked is what's the most important habit is it the ability to consume big bolts of content and and you, you do need some of that right you need foundation knowledge right you can't yeah. let someone go and drive a car without you know do the basic health and safety and so forth right so we need foundational knowledge right that's that's key but you know like recently we, we rolled out a a program to one of our teams and we everyone under, went to a five-hour course everybody understood the concept everyone believes in the concept and nobody changed their habits <laughs> but i think that's normal right <laughs> i think i think that's normal right that but they understood it and the understanding gives us a foundation and the course gave us understanding to actually therefore try to change behaviors and those behaviors got changed through coaching mentoring use of social learning to, to share best practice new bits of knowledge going in which are you know so it's a campaign of learning rather than a, a one-off event right but the recognition it was it wasn't unsurprising that based on everything we believe that the course didn't have that sort of an impact but you still need that foundational stuff so just but to pass off right i think i think what blew my mind when you did that i mean yours was triple digit in the difference what blew my mind was the analysis of comparing the two and a, in essence a single digit difference to a triple digit difference in essence to what we talked about earlier so what are the habits that we're trying to get and the habits we're trying to say here is if we're all learning in different ways sometimes we want to learn through chat gpt sometimes through a youtube video some sometimes through a course or a webinar you know the lots of this way it's all different interactions the, the key though and people mention curiosity a lot in terms of it it's having that curious mindset it, it's challenging ourselves to to keep going towards it um and if those habits are continuous and at some bit it's why it's why every social media company measures engagement in the same way facebook instagram youtube they all measure the same thing right which is active usage either daily active usage weekly active usage or monthly active usage and they're saying at some bit at some point if you use our products enough at a regular period enough you've got the habit of using our product and, and i think learning is the same thing right and the use and we see the use of views in the same way that and your data basically said categorically as it has with 10 other case studies that a certain frequency, and it is different to an external audience to an internal audience, but a certain frequency means you've got the habit. And those people who have that habit when it measured against the key, their key KPIs on a mass of data, not on a one, one piece of data, make, you can see the difference. And everything, we see it on call centers, salespeople, engineers, everything towards it. So I think what you saw there was groundbreaking, but like I said, I think it, it is, but it's also quite a radical new way, right, to measure. 
we think about, we've heard, we've all buy into 70, 20, 10 or five moments of need. Yet traditionally, we're still tracking just the course completion correlation to a business outcome, right? Even though we believe in 70, 20, 10 or five moments. So I think that, I think the way that we are measuring it with this, how, how many people have you created the habit for? And in Avon now, obviously every, every review call we do, we're really only focused on one thing. How do we drive more people to have that habit? Because the belief is when we do the measurement, that's going to make the difference to business performance. And it's not just Avon, right? It's like most of our clients, we saw an amazing business review from Asda yesterday, absolutely believe that selling more cars is related to engagement and learning. And therefore, when they're thinking about it with the, with the CSC, it's how do we help and how do we work together to, to drive that engagement? So I went for too long, but it's a passionate subject. Siri, Siri, yeah, uh, Siri and Shane, you were gonna, I think you were, and Tan, if you wanted to be able to come in here. You want to start, so polite. Look at you, you're so polite. Shane, you go for it. You go first. No, I insist, Siri, please go ahead. I'll, oh, okay. I'll follow you. No, I was thinking about, oh, I love this. Oh, I love this, Andy, how you did this and how you sort of measure behaviors. Oh, I love that. Um, one thing we did at Scandic was that we combined, um, so we had, we measured, uh, so the, the, the what the, um, <laughs> if we did like, for example, a training course or activity uh, for service, to increase service, then we could follow the data uh, for a specific region. So the things we did there, what they did, what they participated in, and we could also follow the, the customer data and the business data. So very much like Fowler did in their pubs. Uh, so that's the closest I got to what you did, Andy. But um, so cross run people data with business data and Yale data with the activities you do to find what makes effect. Mm. Shane? Yeah, a couple of reflections from my side. Um, I think the first one Andy Lecky called out is that in my experience of partnering with Fuse over the last seven years and, and trying to find a way to, to leverage the technology to maximize it, um, we also fell into a, not a trap, but like into the direction of let's create something and then connect it to our performance metrics after we've created it, right? So I think what we've learned over the course of our partnership is that we need to flip the script, right? So we're definitely in that vein of thinking that, okay, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Like, what is that challenge, right? And then what are the associated metrics with that? And then starting to create experiences in an environment that supports that specific metric. But to your point, it only captures one part of that audience or, or part of that audience, which is potentially that, that audience that needs to uh, reduce that time to competency, whether that's onboarding or just bringing up their knowledge to that, that capability where they can efficiently run a hotel in this circumstance. Right? But what I'm really passionate about, and this is what VV planted the seed in my head the last time I spoke to her, right? and we had a discussion about how do you calculate the emotive value of these learning experiences, right? How do you calculate that one person that you have now enabled to do their job to the best of their capability that puts a smile on their face and that says, yes, I'm ready to tackle the day. I feel capable, I feel enabled. Like that's where the beauty is, right? Because then all of a sudden that one person's happiness transitions into a wealth of, of power and, and data. Does that make sense? No, I love that. I love, I, sorry, sorry I, lo I, lo I love that, right? And it's it's... But I think all of us are educators, right? We're, we're learners, we're trainers, we're teachers, right? And some of us, some of us still have the ability to do that face to face. Others, we use technology as a way to get to masses, right? So whether that's us in a few school, we're reaching all those kids and you know, ten million kids. I get the joy from the comments they're saying, as you said, right? I've learned, learned five minutes. I think one of the best examples I, I see is like you know, going to the my coffee shop, right? And there's a lady there who's new towards it, and she looked miserable for the first three, four weeks, right? Because it was obvious she didn't know what she was doing, right? It was obvious, right? Mm -hmm. And then about four weeks later, went in there, she beat the smile. And I asked mm -hmm. her, well, you know, what's what's changed in your day that you've now got a smile on your face? And she goes, I know what I'm doing now. So mm -hmm. to your point, right, the faster that we can help people to get that comfort and confidence in what they're doing, then the the, the more people we we allow their butterfly wings and them to blossom as flowers, right? That ultimately mm -hmm. is, is, I think, what the what we all care about, right? We're all passionate about mm -hmm. towards that, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, I think, Technology definitely can play a part. So that whether it's Google search or it's ChatGPT, you know, it, it's the being able to. If I'm if 
if I'm great at confidence, if I can find the answer to my problem, right? So I've got a digital coach. That's part of the answer, I think, of what we're all driving towards. But yeah, beautifully said, I think, Shane. Go, Siri. Yeah, that made me think about um, a travel agency that I helped during the pandemic. Um, it's it, the company's called Ticket, and they have this omni-channel sales strategy. So they have they have you can order online, you can call, but you can also go into a, a store and order a trip or a, a journey. So they had to let go all their people uh, because of the pandemic, and then I came in when they started to realize that they they. You know that now they you're going to open up the stores again. They needed to hire like a huge amount of junior sales staff because everybody left doing something else, re reskilled for some other job. Um, so what we did, we created like um, we identified the ten most common customer cases, and we uh, created. So, so they came into the, to the store and they did this learning bit about the most, you know, the most common customer case, and then they practiced for the rest of the day. And they had their um, their manager there, they had colleagues, a mentor, and all kinds of things. The only thing they didn't have was something like Fuse, so we had to make it really manual. Um, but that's, you know, the next step. But what we could see was that we very much like Hilti did, uh, we got them, um, sort of got them, but effect they became more effective salespersons much shorter than before. So I think it was like down from 12 months to three or six months. Mm. And just, uh, just thought, just because it was shout out there, just for you, Vivi, because I thought you're going you're gonna to like this, right? This is the... Um... The new search analytics uh, that's uh, hopefully coming soon, which is instead of us having to manually give you all your search data, this is the type of dashboard. So it shows you, you know, it'll show you when your search is number one, number two, how often it's coming up to one, two, three position, all the most popular searches. So to your point, right, a dashboard that allows you to understand what content do I create um, that's missing or that people are getting to, or actually how accurate, you know, how accurate we're labeling stuff and making the stuff available to us and fine. So yeah, I just thought that would, that might make a smile on your face. Um, which, which maybe leads to the, the last question then guys, right? So the last question then um, was, and I think maybe that's- But Steve, could yeah, we yeah, no. bring up, there's this great comment here about learning funnel. Yeah, this um, uh, I just need to find it back. Yeah, yeah, there's a great question, which is actually yeah. that might be. I can read it out. I yes, can read please. it out for you. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's from Brian. A learning funnel is like a marketing or sales funnel in the sense that the wide top of content and engagement funnels down to a business objective at the bottom. The further towards the bottom, the more variables at play. And maybe, maybe between yourself and Andy, right? Because obviously, you know, Tanith, you. Are helping our clients design um, design learning back from business problem, but at the same time, we'll, often what we're saying is, in Andy's case with Avon, is uh, you look at the business problem, and one of the ways we're going to measure that, right, is have we created the habits of learning. So for us, obviously, one of the things we use is the learning engagement funnel and trying to understand where people are dropping off. We use the lemmings analogy, right? So we can look at our data and say, where's the drop-off point? Is is the problem between registered and active? People are actually registering or they've been registered, but they're not coming in. And that's obviously nothing to do with the platform, nothing to do with the content, nothing to do with the learning experience, because they haven't got to that bit yet. But it's that's so that's our top of the funnel. Then we're into kind of the next piece of the funnel, which is okay, they've come into the platform, but maybe they didn't engage. So they looked around, put the head in the door, and said, actually, there's nothing interesting here. And that's a problem, right? So that's a problem of maybe our content's wrong, right? There's nothing popping out or they couldn't find what they wanted to get to, right? So it's a different set of problems to address the fallout. And, and again, this could be different in different audiences for different countries, right? Not even across the platform. So some, you might find you're, you're totally, we've seen this in data with Avon, right? That it's, it's working beautifully on the registration access part in one place, not so great in returning users. In other places, the returning users is great. And it's all different strategies in different markets. And then for us at this last piece, it's in, okay, they're engaged, but they're not coming back. So we haven't created the habit yet. So, you know, what can we do to actually get them to engage and want to come back? So that habit is done. And ultimately, I think when we, when we correlate, what we basically see is the more returning users we have, those ret it's the returning users that perform higher 
then non-return users. So the question for us normally with our hypothesis is, what's the business problem and how to, on that journey, do we create people to have the habit to learn in that side way? But yeah, interesting for you guys, maybe anyone else to come in on that. Yeah, I, I think understanding your, your data and spending the time truly getting to know what's going on within um, your experience is, is, is vital. As you said, <clears throat> there are many, um, areas that, could, that can uh, display differences. So it could be by region, it could be by role or department. Um, by, by understanding this funnel, and it's something that we, we tend to refer to as a, as a first point now, is it, it starts to hone in on where the, the origin of some of your challenges may be. And then applying the 12 levers, it could be that you need to do work in the adoption space and getting people to engage and log in more frequently. And that could be through things like communications and change management or training. Um, but if they're coming in and then not engaging or they're coming in and engaging but never coming back, then you start to look at the levers around content creation, site design, communications again. Are your communications lending themselves to getting someone in on that first time? Here, here's Fuse, but they're not lending themselves to, and by the way, we recommend you come and use Fuse once a month or, you know, wording that drives that continuous behaviour. Um, but the measurement piece, I think, is a, a great example where it's not just about realising value in, in its truest sense of what you, you're achieving right now, but it's great for identifying the opportunities that are going to bring you even further value or further growth in the long term. And I think there's a great point there from Eva. I hope you respect that right, Lever. Uh, um, whereas uh, making the point, you have to see where is the resistance. Uh, I, I think that's absolutely true, right? Um, maybe people want to learn, but they don't have the time. And that's the bit you pointed, I think, Andy, around line managers. If they're not actively engaged, they're probably saying to the people, actually, you know, you're, you're, I'm not going to let you be engaged because I don't believe in the concept of, you know, taking a bit of time out um, to, to, to do stuff or using mobile phone to catch up when things are quiet on the on the shop floor. Not relevant content, the same thing, right? If, you, if you're not personalising the experience, if the content page is for everyone in the business rather than my role then or, or my interest, that's, that's going to um create a barrier of stuff as well so i think a really good really good you know piece around there and obviously ultimately right the data helps us with this we've now got the ability to look at the data to know per market per role where, where the where the problems are where that friction and that resistance is that you talked about absolutely any other points on, on that guys or we want to jump to the last question so let's have a let's have a go with the final question uh, uh, to come with it and guys do, do feel free to ask the panel any questions you want uh, let's let's pick their brains and see what um, what uh, how we can get the most out of these guys. Um, so I think the final question maybe Andy was for all of us, but maybe you want to shout out and ask the question. Hang on, Steve. There's a oh. question here in, uh, in the chat about resistance from Leva. That's interesting. Do you want to read? The one that I was just talking about actually. Yes, but the 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 thing about time. It's, it's interesting because I think when I ask my audience uh, what's the biggest challenge is right now, it's always time, lack of time. And I think there's nobody uh, is nobody's going to give us more time. So we have to make our own decisions to get more time. Although we, I, I, I have seen some companies, right, um, what they do, they look at the, 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 the biggest downtime in a week. So in retail, it's like Tuesday morning. And then what they do is they have like a few day Tuesday for half an hour or an hour on it. Say that's you're trying to catch up around it. Right. So I love the few day Tuesday concept. So I think I might have interrupted you. No, no, but that's great. But I think if I sort of block one day in my calendar, that was it will soon be scrammed yeah. with meetings. So I think there's something else we need to sort of take charge of our calendars and make time. Mm. Absolutely. Uh -oh. I'm going to add to that very briefly. I promise I'll let you get to the next question because I, I couldn't agree with Siri more, right? So in terms of this concept of time is linear, right? In terms of how we're discussing it right now. So I think it's understanding how do you get people to, to change their perception of the value of spending time to learn, right? So again, it's that self-awareness piece. And yes, you can create an environment that fosters it, right? So there's a, a concept called deal as well that I was introduced to, which is drop everything and learn, which organizations can adopt. But again, even without those mechanisms in place, it's up to us to change the perception of learning and the value that it adds to us as individuals. And then all of a sudden, time becomes irrelevant. You make the time for it. 
Yeah, and you save time by learning new things. So yeah. that's the perception. Great, Shane. Thank you for clarifying even more. Mm. It's, it's a great, it's a great point, guys. I, I do think that again, looking at data piece, right? Of you look at the teams that find the time, and there is a correlation between the managers and leaders, like them giving themselves time. So if the leader is giving themselves time, then they are leading by example to give their teams time. So it maybe goes back to you. You've gone back to your beginning bit, Shane, about, you know, uh, um, and you guys, when you talked about if the leaders aren't learners themselves and are acting in the right type way, then what the data tells us, their teams aren't, right? Because they don't believe in it. And, and to some degree, that's also our job, though, as, the, as learning, uh, I think, experts, right, to convince those people with data that if they give people time and they take the time out, actually the business results will, will improve. So I think the data point is absolutely critical to allow us to convince the people, those line managers and leaders that maybe are not convinced that there's a benefit of, you know, giving people some time to go do that. Okay, um, so final, final, final question. Uh, in the last maybe few minutes or five, five minutes we got left. So how can the rapid evolution of technology, particularly advancements in AI, be leveraged to accelerate and support the development of a learning culture? We, we've hit on some of this. Um, I don't, I'm not going to go first because if I do, I probably won't shut up on this topic. Uh, uh, Shane called me last night for a catch up, just a little five minute catch up saying, you know, that he'd been a polite and lovely as he is, just wanted a little catch up and stuff like that. But he asked me, you know, what's in my mind? It was two hours later, he's locked into me, giving me a certain me and me giving my sermon. So I'm not going to start on that one. Uh, so who wants to give a shot? So how can we start to think about leveraging this latest wave of AI, um, you know, to, to accelerate and help in our learning culture? Some great points in the chat here, but before we go to the chat, which is a uh, um, anyone want to shoot in the echo? Give, give, give me a podium to not shut up now. And this, you guys talk before I do. I think it's a massive world of opportunity, Steve. We talked about this, um, I think it might have been via LinkedIn with um, some of the people on this call the other week. The you know, I think things like chat GPT and, and how it can you know, change the future of, of content creation and, and so forth. The way that the um, AI technology, a lot of what Fuse already has, makes things like search, whether that's an intentional search for a specific thing at a moment of need, or whether it's as part of that discovery and curiosity, how it understands the context of that search and returns the results that are most relevant. Um, and, you know, to come later this year, you've got the, the answers piece where it can extract the answer to a specific question out of a 60 page, um, you know, PDF, for example, that that that's all taking learning forward and making it a lot more easier. And to the point around time, you know, AI can only but help with that. But I do think there's an element of, of caution as well. I think there is a there's a human element to, to learning that needs to be maintained. That I I wouldn't say a worry, but it's a concern that you never you know you don't want to lose that. And and does does artificial intelligence have the the capability to to deliver whatever it may be, with a, a degree of empathy and, and the humanness that comes with, with learning. Yeah, I, I think, first of all, when we look at AI, right, I look at it in, there's, and I think at the moment, every, you know, there's, you know, five years ago, everyone got really excited about kind of recommendation AI. I've done this course, I had another course. Now there's obviously another wave, which is driven by ChatGPT, which, which I think, to be fair, is opening up the mindset of not just that type, but AI in general. So if we, you know, look at some of the things that, for example, already infused, where we're using AI to, to transcribe video to text to make it more understandable. We're using AI to translate that text to multiple languages. With the Fuse School curriculum, we use AI to make a voice of, of that part. Internally, we're now cloning voices like Barack Obama so we can talk to each other in different voices stuff. But that's a, that's a bit of a geeky thing that, that's happening internally. I think with, and just to show for those not familiar with, if we look at some of the things that's on our side, you know, coming through, this is where we're introducing Google.com's uh, the, the same technology google.com into fuse in our in, a, in summer so if you did a search when this is using google but with the same technology that, that google use so if you had a search on this term when was it for collins versus this case which is a tricky answer this by the summertime this technology is now producing exactly the same answer as if the content was internally so if it's on both places internal and external you get the same answer so we're indexing the ability so in essence a company could put all these training manuals, everything, not even care about what they're called, and knowing actually if you ask a complex question, and, and an example, I think a good example of a, um, this is a great example, right, of the capability of AI to understand a complex question 
and find this is on the EU database, which has like five million rec five five hundred thousand documents, five million paragraphs. And that's a pretty complex question, right? Of when did the DA start manufacturing ethylene byproducts? And natural language is hugely interesting, right? Because it's able to understand language in the same way as ChatGPT is. Google has been doing that for a number of years, right? So it understands that until early in 2001 is similar to stock manufacturing. It understands that byproducts is derivatives. And it understands that's a question. So I'm going to give you an answer. Um, so I think it's, I think natural language in itself, and we've seen different applications of that. We've been using natural language in Google for the last couple of years. We're now using natural language in ChatGPT. I think to your point, right, Andy, it's, it's both exciting and scary. You know, on the exciting bit, we all can be Tony Stark, right? So we can all we can all talk to have an AI assistant and we can build an Iron Man part, but also we could build Ultron and destroy the universe, right? So there is that <laughs> there's, it's good and bad, right? So we need we need to figure some of this stuff out, right? We absolutely need to figure this stuff out. But undoubtedly, right, it, all this stuff is going to transform how we think of learning, I think, and how we think of coaching, performance, all of it. Any else want to come in here? So any other points coming through? Yeah, on the chat line, is, there's quite an interesting debate or point of reflection on the flip side, where how, how do you handle those that, that are resistant or um, the unlearned but um, comes to play as well? So, so there's a couple of questions there in terms of, you know, how do you manage the resistance? How do you manage those who, who, who don't want to explore as quickly, who have multiple excuses for not having time, um, who need to unlearn habits? Uh, so I think that's, that's been a point of reflection on the chat. And, and, what, and I think really quickly, right? I think undoubtedly, the closer the technology we can use to consumer habits, I think is is reduced the friction, right? So if we're used to using Google, it makes it easier. If we're used to using YouTube, it makes it easier. If we're used to using feeds. So I think if we can piggyback on the habits that have been created by the consumer giants, right, that that's one way. And obviously, some of us are going to be creating for new habits through chatbots. Um, that's not maybe mass, mainstream yet, although 100 million in the first couple of weeks is not a bad start, right? Uh, um, but I think for for us, one thing is whatever those habits are that we've already got, rather than try to, and I think to some degree, that's why I think traditional e-learning is a challenge because you're trying to create a new habit for people to go through one hour e-learning courses or half hour e-learning courses. That's not a habit we choose to do in our personal lives that, that often. So how do we tune in more to the habits that are being created for us by Microsoft and Google and the rest of the tech giants? I think Steve, just going back to the very start of the presentation, if we think about, um, you know, how we learn in our personal lives. If I, if I Googled, how do I change my tire? And I get the instructions to you know, work out how to do it. And then I get in my car and I go, it's so natural that I don't feel like it is actually learning. Yeah. Now, yeah. how do we translate that feeling that I have in yeah. my personal life into yeah. corporate learning and organizational learning that makes actually the, the consumption of information or, the, or the, the learning of knowledge so natural that actually I don't even consider it that I've actually been on a training course yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or I haven't trained. It, it's a really interesting one that it's probably a nice note to leave it on a, for well, next time. But, I, 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 love, I love that, right? So someone actually asked me the other day, right? What is Fuse, right? So can you give me Fuse in, in one word, in, in sentence? Well, at least our aspiration of what we want it to be, right? In the, in the perfect customer, in the, in the perfect future, right? And I, I, I went back to kind of Bruce Lee into the dragon for those probably, and I know for those older I remember it, right? Someone said, what's your, what's your style of fighting? And Bruce Lee goes, it's the art of fighting without fighting. And to some degree, I think the, you know, what you're saying, and I agree with what our aspiration is for learning to be the art of learning without learning, right? So I think that's the part that it's frictionless and it's just what we do, right? It's just what we do and we're evolving, we're developing, but it hasn't felt like, you know, we've gone off to go and do some learning. So yeah, we are, we are learning without learning. <laughs> um, so I think there's a question for Sylvia. Sylvia, I think there's been a great debate, loads of great conversation, I think, happening in the chat. If we make sure that we uh, capture the chat, um, so that when we send on the recording, we can also send on the, the great conversations that have been happening on the side as well. Human chat, not AI chat. Just want to make that clear. Now. Great, great human chat, which still has value in today's world. We haven't put our chatbots on and gone to the beach. 
<laughs> well, thanks again, you guys. Thank you for the panel. Um, uh, massively, thank you so much. Uh, inspirational talks, uh, all got our brains thinking towards it. Um, it's always an absolute pleasure to talk to you guys, right? So thank you so much. And hopefully the audience got some, some value. Uh, we're getting recording out there. And so we will take care of all that, all that amazing stuff in the background. Mm. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you for the chat also. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you soon. Bye.